Professor James Gillum, uh, you and I have had a, a conversation before. Um, it was uh, a riveting conversation. And for that reason alone, I was eager to, to talk to you again. There's also a, about a 60-page section of your memoir that I, I hadn't uh, gotten to. And having read that, having read those additional 60 pages, I was eager to talk to you again. But also, I, I wanted to have a, um, a conversation with you, sort of history professor to history professor. And so we'll, we'll do that uh, as, as we go. Just um, a, a couple comments on your, on your memoir. Um, as we get into it, um, I really like it, and uh, it's a, it's a roller coaster ride. There are pages where you're recounting what you find in the archives, and and uh, you know, and you know that cruises along, and that's nice information. And but then you know, two pages later, it's like you're plummeting on this uh, you know extreme roller coaster with these incredible, incredible descriptions of of such. Uh, such intense experiences. And I was thinking about it last night. It seems like there are three, I, I identify three distinct voices in your memoir. There's the documentarian or maybe the history professor sort of giving us, you know, the historical background. There's the, the cool narrator. And then there's the street fighter. And I have to kind of, <laughs> admit, I, I have to kind of admit, I like the street fighter uh, the most <laughs> of those, of those three personas. Um, you describe a scene in the memoir, you're actually, you've left Vietnam and there's a, a woman who doesn't want to sit in the same row as you because you're a soldier. And um, you overhear her make some comment. Uh, and then there's a Marine who comes and sits next to you. And I, I won't recount what you say, um, but uh, your response to her and then what you did, you know, you and the Marine then proceeding to talk about the Vietnam War, knowing that it was going to irritate the heck out of her. Um, there's just something I, I, uh, I like. It actually reminds me a lot of the neighborhood I grew up in, sort of the, <laughs> the attitude, the attitude that's there. So there are these distinct voices, at least in my, my assessment, and I, I think it's a, a great memoir. And I, I really appreciate that, that you wrote it. I, I um, thought we could just start off with some... Uh, questions just about basic historical stuff and then maybe we can get into more oh you know slightly philosophical or, or psychological stuff one of the one of the stories you mentioned uh, in this section of the memoir I have in mind is this fellow called Lum and I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about that he was a was he was what we call a or what you guys called a Kit Carson is that right yeah, uh, I have no idea why they named, why they gave them that name, yeah, yeah. but it was uh, assigned to a, a program for using the former enemy in areas that they were familiar with. Um, yeah. And so Lum was, uh, I believe he was a former NBA. Uh, which means he had come down from North Vietnam, was in their regular army, yeah. um, and he was familiar with the area we were working in. Um, no one trusted him. <laughs> I, you know, yeah. Our attitude was once you're on the other side, you're really always on the other side. We figured he probably just decided to become one of those Kit Carson scouts so that he could avoid... Um, what was sure to be some really bad treatment by the uh, uh, the Arvin soldiers in interrogation, because he had been captured, probably. I'm guessing. Or? Yeah, yeah. Been... yeah. He was he was captured on the field of battle, yeah. and decided that he was going to uh, join up with the American forces yeah. rather than go through uh, uh, what was more than likely going to be some some pretty painful interrogation. With the South Vietnamese forces, right, right, yeah. so and um, but you know his his actions when he was with us uh, made it clear that he was he was not really on our side. Uh, yeah. We were in an area, and it was the dry season, and he knew we were looking for water, you know, uh, a safe place to get some water, and he said he had no idea. Uh, where there were any wells or streams that uh, we could approach. And, mm. you know, 
according to what we had been told about him, he had lived and worked in that area for several years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, when we woke up at night, the scout dog woke up at night, and I saw him yeah. unloading rifles on the perimeter of our, our night position. You know, it was pretty clear he wasn't on our side. He was, you know, the scenario that I envisioned was he was um, disarming uh, the weapons at one particular position in in preparation for uh, a charge by the bad guys through you know through that part of the perimeter. Once the enemy is inside the perimeter, it get, things get really nasty. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you describe some of that uh, later in the memoir. I mean, one one of the things I'm wondering because I've heard things like this a number of times from Vietnam vets that we didn't we had these Kit Carsons and, and sometimes it worked out. But I, I've heard I've heard enough vets say he just disappeared one day, or <laughs> there'd be mysterious things like um, oh, I forget the details. But you know, after a while, we gathered that somehow. Our Kit Carson was getting info to the other side, which was helping them pinpoint their mortar mm -hmm. rounds and things like that. Mm -hmm. It just seems like yet another one of those things that makes the Vietnam, the way the Vietnam War was prosecuted, hard to understand. That's yeah, it, there was there was always you know the the levels of politics and overall strategy that were worked out uh, outside of Vietnam uh, or mm -hmm. at MACV headquarters. Mm -hmm. And then there was the tactical level, which was our, you know, the day-to-day -day thing, which was worked out by the men in the field. And those different levels didn't always work together. Uh, no. No, that's another thing I've noticed, and I'm interested in your response to this too. You know, you listen to the guys back in D.C. who are citing data. They've got all this data in front of them, you know. And according to the data, mm -hmm. the war is going fine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then you talk to the 18-year-olds in the field, and it's a completely different story. You know? well, that's what I, in, in my book, that's, that's what I call the difference between the big picture and the life in the small picture in in the you know life in the corner of the big picture which was our our small picture you know the the day-to-day yeah. -day reality um i just read last week um uh a book about the battle of hue mm. during the tet offensive yeah. and at that time uh, general westmoreland refused to admit that the city of Hue had been occupied by thousands of North Vietnamese troops. Wow. And so he sent a company of Marines, 200 Marines, to remove what he described as maybe one company of Viet Cong, possibly uh, NVA soldiers, from the Citadel. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that battle lasted almost six weeks. Yeah. And, you know, there were literally thousands of enemy inside that city. Well, I've heard about that. We, we have a vet right here in this area uh, named Cam Buchanan, and he was one of those first Marines that crossed the Perfume River mm -hmm. about a block from the Citadel and just mm -hmm. realized this is it. I mean, there's no way, you know, we're just yeah. – completely overpowered yeah so there's that that disconnect again but you know the, the I don't know the lofty view and the ground view mm -hmm. there's a there's another question I, I just a historical question related to your particular story but it's related to something that I, I hear a lot and that is kind of a split between the guys like you who are out in the field out on patrol setting ambushes uh, out in the fire bases and things like that and then the guys in the in the, the rear echelon, and there was a particular name for the rear echelon guys, and uh, uh, but I won't repeat what that is. It's REMF, so the rear echelon, and then then we 
but then we finished that out. But you, you tell a story of um, a rear echelon guy. If I remember right, you needed some ammunition. Yeah. And, uh, just tell us, just kind of recount this story for us. Well, we came in from the field to get rearmed and re-equipped because we were going on the Cambodian invasion. Yeah. And, you know, this is a major biggie, right? So uh, we came back to the base camp in Pleiku, and um, company commander sent me, uh, got a, uh, a truck, a deuce and a half truck, and sent me and a couple other guys to pick up ammunition for the company. And so we got to uh, our, our uh, resupply area, and they were locking, you know, there was a sergeant there that we didn't know, and he's, he's locking the door. We said, you know, uh, hold up, we got uh, to draw some ammo, and uh, we're the, f the, the first platoon for our company. There'll be a lot of other guys here in a few minutes. And he said, uh, we close at 6 o'clock, and it's after 6, and I'm out of here. I, I thought, uh, you know, uh, we don't punch a clock in the, in the jungle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, one of, my, one of my, my friends was a bit more forward. He was thinking about just shooting a guy and, you know, breaking it. And, you know, we can't do that. Yeah. So we went back and told, uh, told the captain, and he said he'd take care of it. In the meantime... Uh, we got together another truck and some some money and decided to send uh, send the truck into town to get some beer. And the the beer patrol, as we called it, mm. got on the radio and said, "Hey, we're in trouble. There's there's a firefight here." So we ran down there uh, on every conveyance we could think of. We got into a gunfight, and when it was over we found this sergeant that no one knew. The rear echelon guy. Right. Yeah. And he's got a suitcase full of greenbacks, which you're not allowed to have in Vietnam. And he's got a truck full of ammunition. Mm. And, you know, we had been in a, actually in a gunfight trying to get our ammunition back. This guy was selling our bullets and stuff to the enemy. Um, so there was, there was no discussion about whether we should shoot him. The argument was who would get the privilege, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, fortunately for him, the MPs showed up and they took him away from us. Wow. So, yeah. But, you know, that, that's the kind of stuff that was going on sometimes. Yeah. Um, now you, I don't, I don't want to spoil the story for those that, that, that read it, but uh, was it the the MP officer or the MP, the senior MP, decided how to package this guy up? And yeah, um, he was a lieutenant, and oh. um, he decided that um, rather than than have us shoot him or allow us to shoot him, uh, he he uh, sent me in to get some, a roll of barbed wire. So we ended up giving him a body wrap in barbed wire, and they slammed him down on the tailgate of this deuce and a half truck. And then he, it, it, it was really kind of funny after that. He told his, uh, one of the guys in, in, in the MP unit with him, he yeah. said, you know, I, I want you to drive this truck. And the guy said, uh, sir, I don't know how to drive a stick shift. And he said, I know that. Yeah. yeah. And so as this kid was learning how to drive the stick shift, you know, he kept jerking and stopping and this guy kept falling off the back of the tailgate. And, sure. uh, of course, they would pick him up ungently as possible and slam him back on the tailgate. Never knew what happened to this guy. And, mm. You know, we, we lost count and interest in him. And sure. Lost count of how many times he fell off. But, uh, oh, gosh. You know, well, yeah, and it's impossible to, to feel sorry for him. Yeah, you know, uh, our first sergeant, um, actually, we found out he was selling rations to um, Vietnamese on the black market. We went into a, a village, 
and got a convoy. And it just so happened that we had not eaten in about, you know, almost a week. And during that week, uh, the first sergeant offered to sell me one meal to divide between my squad. Mm. And, uh, you know, there were no takers on that. But anyway, when we got to this village, uh, I looked in a hut and I saw stacks of sea rations with our company markings on it. So I just took them. And uh, the guys in the truck told me to look out and, and get down, and I did. And they ended up shooting a guy who was going to shoot me in the back, a Vietnamese guy. And, uh, you know, the MPs who, who uh, escort convoys and stuff, Yeah. Uh, they're trying to sort things out. And for a minute, me and my guys were uh, going to get charged with uh, shooting civilians and, until it was made clear that, you know, what unit we were, and then we pointed to the unit markings on the sea ration cases. And then it was up to the first sergeant to explain how our food got into that village instead of delivered to us a week before in the field. So what was his the black market was a real yeah. concern. Yeah. What, what was his explanation? Did he have uh, it? He said he had no idea. He said maybe somebody just raided the uh, mm. uh, raided the warehouse, the company stores, while he had been in the field. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. you know, considering the fact that this guy was sitting there inside the company perimeter while we were out in the jungle, we were patrolling every day. And, you know, we, we came back from a patrol, and I had a couple guys hurt, so I was not in the best of moods. And he, he called me over, and he says, I know you guys are hungry, so if you got uh, 10, 15 bucks, I can sell you a meal to divide. I, I, my response was to go and clean my weapons so I knew it wouldn't jam when I shot him, because I was, I was <laughs> angry enough to do. It's, uh, it's just... Uh... You know, just hearing all this, I just can't imagine just the pressures. I mean, just even just this, uh, we don't need to talk about it, but, a, 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 you know, a, another story. This is near the end of the memoir. You're getting a hot shower, and this, <laughs> guy, this, guy, this guy's pulling rank on you and telling you to get out of the hot shower. Yeah. Uh, it's just, it's mind-blowing. It, it was about, it was about uh, the, the rank and, and caste system yeah. in the Wouldn't army. Yeah. you understand? I mean, you know, that's how the system works, but, man, give a guy a break. I mean, that was your first, that was your second hot shower in like 10 months or something like that? Yeah. You didn't even get to enjoy, didn't yeah. even get to enjoy that one. It was about privilege and, you know, in, in the military, um, Good things go to people who have rank. Yeah, you know. And well, which which relates to an, I think another theme in your memoir, and that is how you know the lifers, right? And and of course the military needs lifers, but I I know what you mean mm -hmm. is that you know junior enlisted there is that that divide. How the lifers are eager to go out there and collect that body count, right? But that's not that, necessarily in the interest of the nineteen year old who's. On well, you the see, that was that was. That's the, the difference between strategy worked out at MACV and, and in Washington, D.C., and tactics. Yeah. Um, uh, the war of attrition was something that was agreed on yeah. uh, and developed uh, at the level of MACV. You know, Westmoreland's uh, level of the war, his office, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and basically it meant that we had to we had to kill enough of their soldiers to make them give up. I mean, that is, just that policy there reflects the level of historical ignorance about Vietnamese resistance. Mm, mm. Um, you know, I, I think I, I said before that, you know, Ho Chi Minh basically laughed that off with the comment, uh, you know, we fought the Chinese for 900 years. You guys have been here less than 20. This is not a problem for them. But anyway, yeah, yeah. what 
the war of attrition meant for us was we had to get a body count. And yeah. sometimes it, it, it got to the level of absurdity. Mm. We would be in discussions about how much of a body counted as a whole kill. You mentioned that. Yeah, you, you know, mentioned that. Um, yeah. Well, and so, and, and the practical consequences, if you've got a captain who wants to make major or a first lieutenant who wants to make captain, I mean, they're the ones who get the credit, right? And yep. so then that has, that has trickle-down consequences for, you know, yeah. the operation of the day. Captains and lieutenants don't walk point. Captains and lieutenants don't go in tunnels. Uh, Let me, you just said something, and, and we, I do want to get to the sort of the psychological, uh, philosophical theme. But you just mentioned something that, that I experienced when I was in Vietnam, and I'm interested in your response. Um, I've been twice, and I'm, I'm, I'm going back fairly soon. And, you know, uh, the, I've had this experience, I think, twice now, talking to Vietnam, Vietnamese and, and just thinking, gosh, these people are so nice and they're so friendly. How could that have been, you know, such a tough war? These, these people just seem so nice. But then the issue of China came up, and, you know, this is 2017, 2018, mm -hmm. and the tensions between Vietnam and China. And it was interesting because when the topic of China came up, the Vietnamese I spoke with, there was a very subtle change. They became <laughs> a little more serious, and the, 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 the subtext of what they were saying was, if the Chinese want to fight, will fight. And I'm thinking, this is a really tiny country and China's huge. But I just got from them kind of, you know, we just want to live our lives and we're nice people. But mm -hmm. if the Chinese want to push it, we'll fight. And we'll see what happens. Does that make sense to you? And I'll, I'll I just remember, like, I feel like I got a little insight at that, at that yeah, moment. Yeah, you know, the, the, character. the history of Sino-Viet relations goes back to the second and third century BC mm, yeah. when Vietnam was conquered and became a colony to the, uh, on the southeast edge of the Han Empire. And mm. the term now, Vietnam, is a, 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 a linguistic perversion of what the Chinese called them. They called that area Yuan Nan, which means far south. Mm. And over the centuries, it is they have become Vietnam instead of Yuan Nan. But uh, when the Han Empire began to break up, um, they saw their the Vietnamese saw their chance and rebelled, and they fought for the next nine hundred years to get the Chinese. Uh, occupiers out of the country. 900 years. Yep. Now, also know that during the Mongol dynasty, the Mongols sent invasion forces to Vietnam, and they were, uh, they were fought back twice. Um, the second time, which was much more decisive than the first, the Vietnamese were led by two female generals. Really? Uh, two yeah. sisters, yeah. Trong Tri and Trong Trak. Yeah. Uh, their husbands were generals, but they were killed in battle. And so these women took the fight uh, to the Mongol, uh, the Mongol Navy, which was really very strange for the Mongols. You know, they're, when you think Mongols, you think uh, Genghis and the boys and their ponies. Mm. But they had, you know, they, they sent an invasion force on uh, on ships, and mm. so the Vietnamese uh, got into that very exclusive club of two countries that successfully turned around uh, the Mongol Navy. And the other one, of course, was the Japanese. Yeah. So all of a sudden, what seems to us a very long and protracted fight in in their in, uh, in their historical memory, mm -hmm. to us is a very long and protracted fight is actually pretty short. 
I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, the uh, the Vietnamese have have accepted some major pieces of Chinese uh, culture. Yeah, uh, things like the civil service um, and things like that, uh, tea and silk and all of that. But you know, as as you say, they they want to live their lives and. Um, they don't appreciate the uh, Chinese interference. It's it's about Vietnamese nationalism. It's just an expression of that. Well, and as you you know, as you probably know, I've actually been working on the Vietnamese language a little bit. And one of this one of the things I've learned is that the names that they use to refer to each other are literally translated brother, uncle, little yeah. sister. Yeah. Yeah. So it's built into the language that we who speak this language are a family. It's, mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. it's built into the language. Yeah, I mean, we, we knew Nguyen uh, uh, Ai Kwok uh, as Ho Chi Minh. Uh, he took that name uh, after the Versailles Conference. But in Vietnam, most of the Vietnamese called him Bac Ho, Uncle Ho. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that that that's another part of Chinese culture that was somehow transferred into Vietnam. Mm. The, the family is the center of all things. Mm. And uh, you know. Um, yeah. Well, I haven't made much progress with the language, but you know, I've only just started. But even just learning that. I feel like wow, that's you know that's kind of important. It's built. It's it's one of the most basic elements of the language. This sense of the way we address each other, mm -hmm. treat each mm -hmm. other as family members. Even yeah, if you're speaking to a stranger, you're still addressing one another in that in that language. I, just one more historical question. Um, you mentioned the, the the Vietnamese women who were the military leaders. Did you uh, ever see any women Viet Cong? Did you ever come across women? Viet Cong, or as I fighters, did. as fighters. I did, I did. Um, the first time I came across one uh, in the jungle was also the first time I experienced what what they used to call hand to hand combat. And oh, that's right. Yeah, that's right. What they call uh, personal combat. That's right. And I. I just I screwed it up. I stepped around the corner of a, a small hut, and uh, there were two people there. One was a male, one was a female, and I managed to get rid of the male. Yeah. And the female hit me with the back end of her rifle and knocked me out. <laughs> so I was like, That's right. okay. Uh, you know, like I said before, you, you learn lessons. Um, these people, That's you know, I, at the time I had no idea about the Vietnamese female warrior tradition. I just had been told that there were some women out there and that they were tough. They were like the Israeli Sabras. Mm, yeah. Um, and yeah. so I, my first experience with, uh, with them was what you would expect from a Sabra, you know. Yeah. She took care of me and basically she left me for dead. Yeah. Well, that's right. I remember in our previous discussion now, and in your memoir, you write about that. And then uh, we won't go over it again now, but I mean, one of the really powerful passages in your memoir is that first tunnel story, where you have a, uh, an incident with someone in that tunnel, and you weren't sure whether it was a, a male or a female. Um, yeah. I guess just illustrates the point. I mean, some of these... It, 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 in the end, it really didn't matter. It, it, there was a soldier there, and um, yeah. if I was going to get out of there, then somebody had to die. Yeah, yeah. Let me, I'll just make a comment about something else in your memoir that just is mind-boggling to me. I've heard it other times as well. I, it's just hard to believe that this was true. And then, we'll, and then we'll, we'll go to another theme. And that is the idea of being out processed out of the Army, like within 24 hours after leaving Vietnam. That is, that is, now I'm sure as a soldier you're thrilled that I'm out, right? But, <laughs> as a draftee, yes. <laughs> yeah, but I, it's just, it's mind-boggling 
Because as you describe in your memoir, you know, getting out of the jungle doesn't mean that your close calls stop. Because you have, you know, I think by my count, three, three incidents that happen even as you're processing to, to get out of the country. Um, it's just mind boggling. I mean, how anybody thought that was a good idea. You know, uh, okay, this guy's in a combat situation, 36 or 48 hours or, you know, a few days later, now he's going to be in downtown Seattle or whatever in civilian clothes. Just hard to believe somebody thought, that was a good idea. I mean, surely yeah. we need some kind of, I mean, looking back, it doesn't seem obvious we need some kind of decompression phase or something. Yeah. Um, I, don't, I don't know why they did it that way, but as you say, I was more than a little pleased to, to just be done with them. Yeah. Um, and I, I think it was certainly no more than 72 hours after I got out of a collapsed building, uh, 72 hours after I stepped over someone who had been shot and got on the plane, right? I was back in Cleveland, Ohio, and my mom was determined that I should go to church. Yeah, yeah. And I'm sitting there just in a daze. And overhearing makes, people asking questions about you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, they kind of talked about me like I wasn't there, which was, in a way, really fine because I had, I had forgotten all the rules of polite conversation. Mm. Um, well, and I think you indicated that with, <laughs> with one of your responses to a question. Not yeah. a not a very church like. That's the that's the street fighter there. Not a not yeah church like yeah. response. It was just too strange, and you know, a couple of days after that, I was back at Ohio University. Oh my gosh! Living in a dormitory, and and the bizarre part about that was the school had just reopened after uh, confrontations about the Cambodian invasion, and you know, uh, some of my my application paperwork had been lost. I was trying to send it from a foxhole in Cambodia. Mm. So, you know, things were really a mess. I ended up in a single room in a women's dormitory mm. less than a week after I left Vietnam. And I just kind of looked around in, in wonder, you know. I mean, I was glad that I had a single room because mm. I couldn't sleep in beds. Beds just didn't mm. feel right, so I'm mm. sleeping on the floor, you know. I and, heard, heard that, yeah. Yeah, and, then, and but I did have the luxury of a shower, mm. you know, and no one pulled rank or anything. The problem was I forgot the assigned hours for me. And so on a Friday afternoon, I just walked down the hallway with a towel on my shoulder and my shower shoes. That's all I had on. Got in the shower, and I'm humming along to myself, and I realize, oh, crap, there's women in these other stalls. And, you know, they, they all took off running. And the, the funny part was, you know, most women in a situation like that cover their, cover their crotch and cover their breasts and there was one woman who didn't do that. She put the towel over her head and calmly walked out. <laughs> I, I spent the rest of that, that year at college looking at women and saying, I, is that the one who had the towel? Oh, oh, oh. yeah, you couldn't identify. <laughs> yeah, but there was, gosh, um, there was no downtime. No downtime. Oh, gosh, it's so, it's crazy. There, there was a student here where I teach who uh, served in Iraq and, uh, in, you know, one of the tough, tough uh, eras in Iraq, and he mm -hmm. told the same story. When he came to the dorm here, he just he slept on the floor. It just the bed just didn't work for him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, let this you know this um, instant transition uh, from Vietnam, and you tell this surreal story of this. You're getting, you're walking on the plane, and this guy gets shot. And I guess it's still an unanswered question. Was it a was it a sniper or was it an accidental thing from an Air Force MP or something? You know, it was. It was not a sniper. It was. It was. Um, 
one of the EMPs on on the base. There okay, so the one, yeah. He was he was uh, the base got infiltrated by what they call sappers. They're basically right. commandos, yeah. Yeah. and uh, they run around dropping what they call satchel charges, cameras right. full yeah. of explosives here and there, and yeah. so we were going up the stairs to get on the plane. Yeah. And one of these guys was discovered, and so there was an MP who was chasing him. Mm. And, you know, the MP had his rifle like at port arms, and he's running, and he fell. And the weapon discharged, and the bullet went, you know, off on an angle, and it hit the man in front of me going up the stairs. And it was, you know, truly a tragic accident. Yeah. But it just goes to show that you're never safe until you get off the plane in your hometown and maybe not then. Yeah. You know? and, and when that guy is hit, just given your, your state of mind, you just kind of step over and keep rolling into the, into the plane. Uh, you know, I, I did my reflex action. I checked him, you know, rolled him over to see if I could help. And, uh, he had a hole in the back of his head and he didn't have a face. Right. Yeah. So there was, yeah. there was nothing else to be done. Uh, and, uh, you know, I also figured you'd be safer inside the plane than, than on the stairs, you know, with the canvas walls on the stairs. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Well, so then you get on the plane and you've got this steep ascent and, and, and you make it home. You tell stories in your memoir of, uh, you know, an incident in Chicago, uh, comments and, and the story we referred to earlier. Um, with the the woman on the plane also making comments, this really unfortunate, you know, episode it, in American. It was the sign of the times, you know that. Yeah. Um, the nation was clearly divided about the Vietnam War, and those people who opposed the war also opposed the people who had to prosecute the war. Yeah. And so. Yeah men traveling in uniform were targets for people who didn't like the war. Yeah. And I was in uniform. Yeah. So, uh, and I, I didn't realize that that would be a factor uh, when I came home. Yeah, what I, I what I like in your memoir, though, is I like your responses. I like that you didn't just swallow whatever you you, you thought or... Or just let things go. Um, you know, you you responded in your own way. It was it I, was not in me to take that kind of yeah that kind of guff. Yeah. Um, I, I I very quickly learned even you know when I was uh, in the stateside army before I went to Vietnam that life was different for people in the services in the military as opposed to civilians. And, uh, you know, we, we lived in different worlds, so we had different points of view. Yeah. Um, and in these, these confrontations after I left Vietnam, there was no chance to sit down and, and talk about points of view or where you live and where I live in, uh, in this life. Mm -hmm. um, mostly because people on my side of the divine, people on the other side of the divine, we were, we were not going to discuss anything anyway. Mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for most people, especially after the news of the My Lai massacre hit, mm -hmm. we were just animals. That's and the perspective. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I I had a, a a girlfriend at the time, and we had planned to meet in uh, um, Hawaii for R and R, and uh, 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 the Milai news of the Milai stuff hit, and she wrote me and said that uh, her and her parents had decided that maybe I was not the same person who left mm. for Vietnam, and she would not. Show what she wasn't coming. Wow! I mean, is that's that's an example of how national news and and things you know incidents that didn't even uh, you know apply to me uh, affected me anyway. Yeah. 
Well, and, and as you and I were saying earlier, I think before we started recording, I mean, this is one of the things I think makes it tough for some veterans still to to share anything at all. Um, because I think, I mean, just there are the difficulty of the memories, but also those memories of um, what they heard, uh, what they experienced when they came home. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's, let's transition. Um, one of the things I'm interested in, you're a, you're a history professor, and as a history professor, um, you've used a lot of primary sources, you know, the, the documents written by people who are there. And then, of course, another primary source is the actual people who were there. And for students of the, the war in Vietnam, you are a, a primary source. And you were telling me how students have interviewed you to, to write papers about Vietnam. And that's what I'm doing now as a history prof who's um, a generation behind you. I, I talk a lot about Vietnam in my classes. And, you know, you are uh, whatever else you are. You're a, a primary source. But one of the things I'm interested in is um, sort of post-war. Um, and the, um, the life of the memories. Um, and I, I have marked in your book um, a, a number of, a number of, of things that I, I thought I, I would read. But I think I'll, I'll focus on, on one, which is maybe, well, I think, for me, certainly the most intense part of the book. Um, won't read the whole thing, just snippets of it. But when I'm, when I'm, and, and we can just use this as, as an example of, of many memories that you accumulated in your, in your tour in Vietnam. And I'm just interested in kind of the, the, the life cycle of these, of these memories. So, you know, the section I'll read now, this has to do with the birth of the memory. Mm-hmm. But this memory has been with you, and now this memory is in middle age. It's about 52 years old, 51, <laughs> 52 years old, something like that now. So I'm just interested in, in just your reflections on kind of the life cycle of that memory. And, but let me, let me just start with just reading some bits. And this has to do with the sapper. You, you, know, you said sappers uh, get over the wire and, and cause trouble. And so there's this incident that you describe. And I'll just read little snippets. And so you, you refer to a, a third sapper that jumps up and you wrote and charged me with a bayonet on the end of his AK-47 because he was out of ammunition and and you were as well. You write that I jumped to my feet and threw my helmet at him to distract him. I needed time to get to my combat knife with the staghorn handle and the nine inch blade. And that's, you mentioned that, you know, that knife several times in the memoir. As he's coming toward you, you write, I called up the instant rage and cold calculating heart that Sergeant Terry told me I needed. Then I spit my conscience and inhibitions out on the ground like Sergeant Clay told me to do. By the time I had closed the 20 foot gap between us, I was determined to kill him as savagely and quickly as I could. Of course, understanding his objective was the same. Uh, he, on the other hand, had the same fate in mind for me, as you say. And he came at me hard and fast in a screaming rage. I'm skipping a few lines. I faced him in the Asian knife-fighting mode with my knife blade pointing down. Um, and then to skip another couple lines. He lunged forward and tried for the nearly instant kill of a stab through my throat and vertebrae in my neck. And then you describe your own, your own responses. And then as it go, you say, I stepped in chest to chest with him, trapped his right arm under my left on the way wrestlers do. And we'll skip a good bit here. You write, his eyes went wide with shock and rage, and he made a deep-throated growling sound. We were so close I could smell the rotten fish of the nuk nam on his breath. That's the sort of the fish sauce or something that's in the Vietnamese food, right? Good condiment. Yeah. And I thought he would try to bite my face or throat because we were that close and teeth were all he had left. Instead, he gritted his teeth and spit in my face. 
Years later, in therapy, I understood that spitting in my face was probably a dying man's expression of courageous contempt. I'm skipping a few lines now. He started making a sound I had never heard a human being make before. And then he, he dies. And then, then you write at the end of a paragraph that you heard that sound in your nightmares until the mid-1980s. That's a, it's, a, it's a powerful passage, and I skipped most of it. Um, it's, it's a detailed passage. Um, so I'll just pitch the general question at you, and, and we'll just see where it goes. I mean, you described there the birth of this memory. So this, this memory you're going to have with you to this moment mm -hmm. now is born at this time. And we don't have to, you know, speak specifically of this memory, but of maybe specifically of this memory or maybe just of, of memories in general. I'm just interested in, in how they've changed over time from birth through, if we could think of them as having a life as sort of birth to toddlerhood, you're a university student, but these memories are with you into adolescence, into adulthood, and now these memories are in, in middle age. I'm just wondering, I don't really even know, know how to frame the question, but just wondering how your relationship with these memories have changed over the, over the years. Maybe that would be a way to, to start, to go at it. In the immediate period, and that means moments to maybe the first four or five years of that particular incident, my response would have been, boy, you barely got out of that one. Mm. And also, um, you did what you had to do to get out of that one. Uh, so many of the times, many of the times, when uh, I killed another soldier, I had a lot of responses that ran from, wow, that was close, or what the hell have I done? Or, oh, you know what? Maybe this guy has some friends who saw you, and you got to, you know, you better look around and make sure that you're not being hunted, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, after I left Vietnam, um, I didn't talk very much about things like that, those memories, with anyone except my brother. Yeah, my just brother, awful Vietnam veteran who... Yeah, had, my, my brother uh, served with the Marine Corps in Vietnam. Yeah. And we had an, we had an understanding of what it meant to be in combat. Um, and and it's, it's very true what they say. Um, if you haven't been there, it's, there, there's, there's just a lot that, yeah. you, there's more than you can explain. Right, yeah. So, you know, as the years passed, um, my view of those incidents, those killings, changed. Um, you know, the, I, I had developed what I called uh, a callus mm. on, my, on my soul. And that's how I got beyond those things that I had done and I had been, been involved in. And then as the callus began to go away, um, you know, in the first couple of years, maybe five to ten years after Vietnam, I realized that my involvement in civilized life had replaced, you know, I created other memories. My, my, my first meaningful employment, for example, when I finished college. You know, I got out of the Army, finished college, 
got meaningful employment, I was working with a veterans rehabilitation program. Right. And so, you know, I, on the one hand, I was able to talk to the veterans and say, look, I'm not just a bureaucrat. I'm one of you. Mm. I understand completely what it is to be a grunt. To be a person who has no saleable skills other than machine gunner. Mm. You know? Mm -hmm. And so that was that was very helpful in getting past those memories. I, I kept that job for almost three years. Because is that because these experiences now can be used at least in some way to do something meaningful. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Which, yeah, which gets to, you know, the, uh, uh, a phrase that you use often in the memoir, which I think was used a lot in Vietnam, don't mean nothing, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. just a kind of a way of, I think, psychologically dealing with, you know, all the stupidity and the horrendous stuff you see don't mean nothing. But it sounds like about five, six, seven years into it, you're saying, well, it can mean something. It can mean... Yeah, the, can the, meaning, the immediate meaning of that while you were in Vietnam was, don't dwell on this. You'll just, there's nothing good that's going to come from it. Okay? Yeah. Um, after Vietnam, after a few years when someone, you know, a, a non-veteran would, would say, well, it don't mean nothing. Well, then you take offense. You know, because it means from a non-veteran, it means that what you did had no significance, no importance at all. And that's not, that was not true, you know. Hmm. Um, after I became a graduate student and then became a teacher, the import and content of the memories changed. It was, what have you, you know, what, what did you do and was it meaningful in the immediate sense? Was it, you know, uh, in, in the wider historical sense? There were different, different ways of looking at those events came, in, came into being, you know. I, finally, I was no longer just a conscript who got lucky in a couple knife fights and a couple gunfights. Finally, I was a person who had a contribution to make to the historical record. And, and it, was, it was just really, really surprising uh, the first time a student said to me, well, okay, in the historical methods cl class, you taught me about primary sources. You're a primary source, and we need to sit down. I need to get your thoughts about this particular. I thought, damn. Well, you know what? It now it. My my life as a soldier has a different meaning. Yeah. It's not about collecting body counts, keeping your men safe on a patrol. Mm -hmm. My life as a soldier now is to help someone paint a bigger picture, and get to an understanding of these of some major historical events. Yeah. Yeah, this this is this is something I, I really hope that that um you know even just in my mind right now I can think of three no uh, they're the tally is quickly growing as I think of the vets I've had interaction with who just decline to talk at all and, and they have different reasons. But one of the things I, I tell them is don't leave your story to people like me. You know, mm -hmm. tell it for yourself. And, and help people like me to try to tell it, but I'm always going to fail. But the more I hear from the people who are actually there, then I, I can fail a little bit better next time. Yeah. You, you know what? I, I feel like I kind of grew from participant to a griot. You know what a griot is? The African oral historians. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, there's, there's a... a a uh, fairly well-known book called um, uh, 
Sunjata and a Tale of Old Molly. And it's it's about this uh, West African king. Um, and it's not written, this story was originally, as they say, not reduced to writing. The griots are hereditary historians in Africa, you see. And they record the entire historical tradition and cultural traditions of the various houses of rulership in West Africa. And I realized when students start coming to me and other historians start coming to me as a primary source, that I had gone from soldier participant to a griot, mm -hmm. which is really very satisfying for an African American for an historian. I, I had become part of a very important tradition in African mm -hmm. life. I had become part of a very important structure in the writing of history in in the western world yeah and it, it 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 meant that i had finally gotten to the point that i asked myself the first time i almost died does it make any damn difference that you were here mm. are you gonna are you just gonna be dead and nobody's gonna care it doesn't mm -hmm. have any meaning at all mm -hmm. well i finally got to a point where those experiences had meaning in, in the broadest sense of the word. Including this conversation right now. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. So I'm interested, so I'm kind of approaching you now, you know, uh, as the student. Um, you know, these experiences you've had as you've you know, obviously what you said is right. A person like me will never, never, ever understand. I served in the military. I know what the stupidity of the bureaucracy can be like, but I, just zero, zero understanding of, of, of what you're, of what you experienced. Um, although I keep trying, you know, this is my goal to keep trying, knowing I'll never get close, but I want to keep trying. But, um, but I, I want to ask you, you know, what these experiences have taught you not you know you had them you know 50 plus years ago over well, mm -hmm. are we, are we are around there about 50 years ago um, um so you had those experiences and not so much what they've taught you in terms of like tactics or strategy and things like that but what they've taught you just about human reality what are the what are the big human human things, you know, so I guess I'm, I'm not just asking you as the, you know, the person who tells historical stories, but the person who's accumulated, who's acquired some wisdom as a result <laughs> of experiencing these things and reflecting on these things. What, what can we learn just about humanity from these kinds of experiences you have? Well, you learn that the point of view or the, the, the description of things that you do change over time. Mm. Um, you know, uh, I went back to Vietnam also, but it was, it was now quite a long time ago. And uh, I met lots of of Vietnamese men who were on the other side. I mean, from the, the, the time I entered the country, you know, the, yeah. the, the people who were doing what we now call the TSA job mm. were all men in uniform and they were armed. And they kind of go through your suitcase and they give you the side eye like, I know you shot my uncle Nguyen, <laughs> you know, you're about the right age. Yeah, yeah. Well, among the people I met there, one of them was uh, a soldier that I shot on an ambush. We clearly established who he was. And, you know, I, I know that on the night that I shot him, 
his opinion had to have been, I really hate this guy. Mm. You know, he's put extra holes in my body. <laughs> yeah. But I met him in the early 90s. And his opinion about that changed. Uh, you know, he wasn't the guy that exchanged rifle fire with me. When he finally understood who I was, he walked right up to me and gave me a big hug and said, you saved my life. Um. I heard him bad enough that he couldn't stay in the jungle. And so he survived the war. Wow. And he took me out for coffee at a Russian tea house, at a Russian coffee shop. Wow. Uh, and he gave me two souvenir bullets in exchange for the two that I had given him. Mm. And then I... That you had inserted into his body. Yeah. And then he yeah. gave you two. Yeah, wow. And then he, you know, I, and I, I went to the home of uh, General Tran Van Tra. We had dinner. And during that dinner, I realized that me and the other veterans that he hosted that evening were no longer the enemy. We were people there who were going to participate in a seminar on Vietnamese history. And he was one of the presenters. So we had become not the enemy, but the students and house guests. Mm -hmm. And we did what old men do. We, we talked about our children and grandchildren and bragged about them. Mm -hmm. He goes, I have, I have uh, a son and two daughters, and you have a son and two daughters. Let's talk about these children here. Mm -hmm. So, you know, things were, were different. They, they, yeah. There, there's no question mm -hmm. that if we had come across each other, in the 60s or 70s, you know. And then actually there was a man at that dinner who um, was in the, in the field as a soldier and uh, had tried to kill the general. And um, the year before we went back to Vietnam, the general stayed in this man's home for a week. Wow. And they became good friends. and. That's how I got the invitation to the general's house. He, uh, he, he told Professor Taylor, he says, if you ever come to Saigon, um, call me up, bring a couple friends, we'll have dinner, we'll get brandy and cigars. And, you know, our lives had changed so much. You know, the, the enmity, the warfare and stuff had passed, had e evolved into friendship for whatever reason, political or, or whatever, and scholarship and, and politeness. Mm. Who would ever have thought mm. that a room with a Viet Cong general, two infantrymen, and a French plantation owner would be anything close to civil? And that's what happened that evening in yeah. the 1990s. So one of the things, just to kind of, you know, summarize, I think what you're getting at is, you know, one of the bits of wisdom is that whatever we, whatever our interpretations are of events early in life, um, those interpretations are likely to change as, as you move through life, because life itself, of course, changes, mm -hmm. and, and the meanings, the meanings of things, which... Um, I mean, just reminds me, you know, we, we hear of, of our, our younger vets from Iraq and Afghanistan and the, the pretty high suicide rates among them. And it's a tragedy all by itself, but is, you know, t going on what you're saying, it's an additional tragedy because by losing them, not only are we losing their, their lives, obviously, and their immediate stories, but, but 30, 40 years from now, we're losing what things they could have learned in retrospect as they look back as their interpretation. And what they could have contributed. And what they could have contributed, exactly, that's right. You know, when, when you end a person's life, you end their contributions. 
Yeah. And I, I think, I firmly believe they are ending their lives because no one, they, no one cares. Mm. You keep, I, I, bet, I bet you a six pack of whatever you like, yeah. you, couldn't, you couldn't walk out of that studio and find 10 people who know about the war in Afghanistan. Oh, that's true. That's true. And these people have been there, and they have they have suffered the privations of combat. Yeah. And they come home, and somebody will offer the offhanded comment, "Thank you for your service," and they have no damn idea of what that service entailed. None whatsoever. And these men, they know that. They feel hopeless. Mm. Which is why I'm trying hard to reach as many as I can. Just to, to, to wrap up, speak to veterans like the one I have in <clears throat> mind right now. Uh, his name is Mike. Mm -hmm. And we can think of a conversation like this, and you know, there's a door close by, and, and Mike is, is invited to talk about whatever, you know, um, Everybody who knows Mike knows that he needs to, he needs to, you know, let some of this out. Mike himself acknowledges this. He walks up to the door, almost knocks, but then turns away. Um, Mike is probably like me. He's from an era where men did not talk about their difficulties. You know, I, I had a next door neighbor who was also um, a Vietnam veteran. And uh, when I published my first book about Vietnam, I let him read it. And our friendly neighborliness disappeared. Mm. And he finally told me, he said, I can't forgive you for what you did. I said, well, what the hell did I do? He said, you talked about it. Mm. You talked about it. Mm. And he said, proper men and soldiers who are to be respected don't talk about it. Mm. That's, that's so wrong. Well, it, it is so wrong. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, it's... You know, I'm think. Yeah, I mean, I can think of a lot of historical examples where that's not the case. Although I'm sure this guy doesn't want to have a literary discussion. <laughs> yeah. Well, and on on the other hand, you should know that uh, this guy was a colonel, and I was an enlisted man. I was a sergeant, mm. and he was also a remf. Oh. Okay. He was he was in charge of log you know logistics. Mm. He never went to the field. He spent 20 years in the military, and he never fired a shot in anger. He never got hurt. Yeah, yeah. And, of course, you need that, you know, in a big institution like the military, you need people doing that work. But, uh, but yeah. I could see psychologically, though, how that would play into how that would play into what you just described. Well, you know what? Yeah. Mike and I, I suspect Mike, but for sure myself, are from an era where they had not come up with a diagnosis of PTSD. If anything, they talked about people who had trouble, who had psychological trouble uh, dealing with combat or its after effects. They said it was shell shock. That's what they called it. And it was, it was a term that was applied with a fair amount of derision. Mm. And these people just aren't up to it. They're mm. not able, they're, they're not man enough to handle the stresses. Yeah. yeah. You know, and, and it's pretty clear in my, in my late age here, in, in the, the, the middle and late age of my memories, that hell yeah, I had PTSD, but no one knew what to make of it other than I was a crazy Vietnam veteran, you know? 
when you react to firecrackers, when I reacted to firecrackers that first summer home, you know, within a month after I got home, I was a crazy Vietnam veteran. Um, when I got into a fight with the younger brother of a woman I was, uh, that I dated briefly, um, it wasn't, you know, the, it wasn't because uh, this guy snuck up on me and, and punched me in the kidney really hard. I mean, he did, he did internal damage, mm. so I beat him up. Yeah. The story, be, you know, the, the, the description of that confrontation was Gillum's just a Vietnam veteran who thinks he's still in Vietnam, mm. that he can get away with killing and maiming people with impunity. That's not the case at all. Yeah. No. Let me. I, I think. I, I think. I may have said. I was asking my last question. I, I do have. I do have one more. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to keep keep trampling on your time. I have time for this. Okay. And I hope you can tell that I like you, and I and I also respect you. And I I want to say that as a preface to to this question, which may be a a really horrible question, but I hope. And if it is, please say so and tell me to drop dead and, and we'll, we'll end the conversation. <laughs> um, um, but I, I hope, you, I hope you, you, you understand my motives and that even though I understand, I'll, I'll never understand, you know, I, I do want to keep trying. This, this fellow, you described this incident that we, that we read, this, um, this sapper who gets in who comes at you with a bayonet. And in that case, you just simply do what you have to do. There's not like there's not a plan B really in that case. So you do what you have to do. I don't know what your views are of, of an afterlife, but just just for the sake of discussion, let's say that there is one, mm -hmm. and that um, when your time comes, you you meet this fellow. Um, what do you think you might say? What would I say? Hmm. We both did our best. Mm. Um, there wasn't any choice. You know, I mean, for all I know, he could have been a conscript also who just found himself in that position. Yeah. yeah. Um, I would say we both did our best and I got lucky. Uh, you know, as you, you, you mentioned my street fighter personality, yeah. you know that when I was growing up, I had a number of street fights. I lost almost every one of them. Mm. I was never good at street fighting, but I was fairly good at killing. Mm. I, I find that really weird. Mm. Um, but you know the the difference is because in civilian life, civilized life, there are actually inhibitions. Someone in a street fight will say, "I'm going to put you in the hospital," but you can't do that in combat. You have to put this person in the ground. Yeah. Or you have to put them on the ground. So. And. and and uh, yeah, and then who knows? I mean, you you say that, and just going again with the, you know, this hypothesis or this uh, image, and you have that interaction. Who knows? Maybe it could be like the incident you had with the the fellow you wounded. You could go off to some celestial tea shop and have a tea, yeah. or something like that. Yeah, um, you know and it, <laughs> That man didn't die because I was angry at him. Mm. Uh, he died because I was scared. And there was, you know, even if I spoke Vietnamese, there's no way I could, I was going to talk him into, uh, we both go our separate ways, you know. No, no, uh, no. Nobody asked that question of me before. That's that's kind of interesting. What if I if I ever 
if I could well, meet this guy. That'd be interesting. Well, it's a lot easier being the question asker than it is being the question receiver. <laughs> How much students all that time? I should mention going from participant to, to primary source uh, and a verifier of, of history uh, happened for me. Um, I got invited to Amherst hmm. uh, to give a lecture about um, uh, Sino-Vietnamese policy during the Vietnam War. And so it was, it was uh, the essay that I discussed was about the, um, the Chinese decision to stop sending so much material aid and send specific, uh, or send um, advisors and engineers, right? Mm -hmm. So come to find out that the Chinese man who interrogated me over off and on over a course of four days was actually um, an engineer uh, and his specialty was roadways and you know we were my unit was in search of and destroying parts of the Ho Chi Minh trails that had been built and camouflaged in the in, in the central highlands of Vietnam. I didn't know about the Chinese policy at the time. You know, this was spring, you know, early in 1970. Yeah. Years later, I read uh, documents and, and, and historical essays about the Chinese decision to send uh, engineers and advisors to the Vietnam War rather than AK-47s and ammunition. Yeah. And I met one of those people. You met one. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, and so for you, it's not an abstraction, something you read in a book, but you experienced it. You were there. It, made, it makes the history much more real. You know, in, in a, if I was still teaching, and I'm in a course, when when that essay about the change in Sino-Vietnamese policy comes up, I can say, you know, that's really, really true. I met this guy named Colonel Han, and he was actually trained at a British school of engineering, and then went back to uh, went back to China, and he was in the the, the uh, PLA, the People's Liberation Army, and they sent him as an advisor to Vietnam, and that's where I met him. So yes, this is really true. This policy was a fact of life. Wow. Yeah, so you're alluding to a, a story that's actually not in, not in your memoir, and, and I, I think since, you know, we'll, we won't get into it now, but you mentioned <laughs> four days, four days, um, where you were effectively a prisoner of the NVA. Yeah. yeah. It was the longest month of my life. <laughs> you know, it was only four days. Oh, oh God. So, yeah. Well, Strange things happen out there. Uh, I mean, we can end it right here. Or, I mean, do you are you interested in talking about that a little bit, or? I sure. Yeah. If if, if you if you want to go there, yeah, we can do that. Let me just let me just 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 I'll just pitch it to you, and you know, what are you, what are you willing to share about that? It's not in the memoir, so I'm a little reluctant to. Well. So I guess I I just want to leave that to you. What, what you're comfortable sharing, if anything. It, it, you know, at the time it seemed very, uh, very complicated and very crazy. Um, with the passage of time, it's, it's, it's both important and not important. I don't know. I, it happened because I got left behind in a gunfight. You got captured. Yeah. Me yeah. and uh, one other person, one other sergeant. And um, I thought pretty much, you know, you, you're going to die right here, but they didn't. 
they took our shoes, loaded us, loaded us up with things to carry, and marched us off toward uh, Cambodia. Um, so, uh, they, they, it was clear that they were moving a camp out of the way of the American patrols. Mm -hmm. And um, they promised that they would not shoot us uh, if we kept up. And they said, if you don't keep up, we still won't shoot you. We'll beat you to death. So we hustled along. We, we kept up. And um, so, um, you know, I... Like I said, I had conversation with this Chinese colonel who was in the the PLA mode of treatment of prisoners. And their mode, even, you know, this thing goes back to World War II. When they captured Japanese, they didn't immediately just shoot them. They, they found it of more value to uh, interrogate them and then convert them to their side. Is that what they tried to do? Convert you to the, their cause? Yeah, one of the Part first of questions... Parts of you, something like that? One of the first questions was, what are you, as a black man, doing in a colonial war, mm. knowing the treatment that uh, is afforded your people in places like Detroit in 1967? You know, um, they Did were very weird. Hmm? Did that make you pause briefly? Um, it it made me pause and consider my position at that time. You see, I was the, the man that I was taken with was a was a white man, a, a white sergeant. He was an E five. I was an E six. I was in charge, and he was my uh, second in charge, but they assumed that he was in charge uh -huh. because I was black. Mm. So the heavy lifting, as they would call it, in the interrogation fell on him. And uh, I got the conversion talks, and he got the hard interrogation. And I was pretty much safe as long as he stuck to name, rank, and serial number. And he was one of those tough guys, you know. Wow. Uh, he gave them name, rank, serial number, and do strange and impolite things with your relatives. And um, hmm. so it was a couple of days before they finally figured out the difference in rank, et cetera. How did you get out? Well, they made a mistake. Uh, they changed me to this tough young sergeant as we did our, you know, our daily walks hauling stuff through the mountains. And, um, you know, we knew we were going north and west, which was into Cambodia. And this, you know, we didn't want to go there. And then we looked, we were on mountain trails and we looked in the valley through the fog and we saw American troops. And wow. he said to me, I'm going home or I'm going, or I'm going to die, but I'm, I'm not staying here. And we're chained together. Oh. So we had to figure out a way to uh, get rid of the guards. We were at the end of the, end of the column and there were only, uh, three guards back there. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, one of them was the guy who had done the rough stuff interrogation on him. One of them was the guy who had uh, replaced Colonel Han and was doing the rough stuff interrogation on me and the other guy we didn't, didn't know. We had to get rid of those guys. And so uh, my friend took care of two of them and I took care of the guy who had been interrogating me. And we ran for the Americans. How, how were you chained? You were chained hand to hand? No, no. 
uh, we had shackles on and um, a four foot, five foot chain uh, on our ankles. And, uh, you know, um, our hands had uh, manacles and a shorter chain. We, you know, uh, we could use our hands, but um, right. not completely freely. So, so you, you mu the two of you must have planned. I mean, you must have sort of had a plan then, like you would be a signal, and now it's time to move. Yeah. Well, one of one of the guys back there guarding us um, had a machete on the back of his pack, and so my friend got a hold of that and used that to good advantage. And um, I managed to get uh, my wrist chains around the third guy, uh, uh, around his neck. And so we got away and got a good head start back down the trail. Uh, the really goofy part about it was as, you know, they realized something was wrong and they started chasing us. And, we got close to our people, and shots were exchanged between our units and the Vietnamese, and we were in the middle. And so, you know, uh, we were screaming, "Hey, it's you know, it's Gillum and and, and Agzinski," and they were saying, "Oh, those guys were, were were dead four days ago. They thought we were Viet English speaking Vietnamese hiding out there." So we had to kind of like briefly show ourselves and scoot in, you know, into the American part of the of the gunfight. Uh, yeah, basically, we had to surrender to our own guns. Yeah, you know, yeah. So, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it just goes to show you the, the craziness. Yeah. So then the chains are taken off, and you're just immediately back in circulation. As it as it happened, the unit that we ran to was my company, my infantry company. So you know, I mean, we had uh, we had files and things that you know we used to sharpen machetes and axes and stuff like that. So we got got the chains on, and um, there were a couple people wounded in in the gunfight. So, uh, I got a pair of shoes. My my buddy got a pair of shoes. When they got medevac, we just took their rifles in. And the company commander says, "Well, you know where they are, right, Gil?" I go, yeah, I do. And um, uh, I I I had uh, revenge on my mind. I had payback on my mind. So. I took the point and we we start hunting again. So wow. But you know, yeah. during those conversations with uh, Colonel Hahn, he said, you know, if you ever go home you should make it a point to learn more about China and its influence in East and Southeast Asia. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, death, so. yeah. and I said, yeah, you know, I'll think about it. You know, uh, you want to unchain me? I said, nah, it's not going to work that way. But um, actually, I did um, end up um, briefly, you know, right after I start working at Case Western Reserve as an administrator, I started taking classes in Chinese history. I took one of those. Yeah. And then I decided to take the plunge and try to learn Mandarin and it made the history so much clearer. And uh, a year later I just stopped working, went to grad school and came out on the other side a long time later as a Chinese historian. <laughs> Another example of um I mean, you, you, that's obviously not something you would have anticipated when you were, when you were there. Heck no. 1907. No. Yeah. No. Yeah. I mean, as, as uh, an undergrad, I, I was uh, a history and poli sci major. I liked history. Um, 
and I just decided somewhere um, while I was in that, that university atmosphere that I didn't want to be an administrator anymore. I wanted I wanted to move to what I consider to be the, the front rank of education and, and become a history professor. So I'm that's the turn I made. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Professor, I think we've I think this is the third time we've come to the end of this discussion and <laughs> I think this is this this time it's for real. Well, my my wife would say, you know, you you talk so much. No, 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 not at all, not at all. I, no, actually, I'm I, I'm I'm confident. I mean, there's there's so much more we could talk about, but I I really appreciate it, and uh, I'm glad for your memoir. I, I really appreciate the time that you've spent, and um, I hope that this, you know, as as time goes by. That this discussion will be useful to uh, to others, especially to other veterans, to encourage them to not necessarily to do this kind of thing, but to somehow contribute to the overall story, or to just realize that things have changed. Yeah, you know? yeah. Uh, their experience has taken on a new meaning, a new. That's right. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. You're most welcome. Thanks. You're most welcome.